internet and welcome back to another episode of Meet La Prensa. I know it's been a little bit since we posted it um, the last time, but we've been do- you know working on a few things here. And one of the exciting things that we've been working on is that today's guest is actually one of our founders, Pablo Manriquez. He's, uh, he's been kind of walking around and working inside the congressional halls uh, as a Capitol reporter for Latino Rebels. So we're really excited to have him on as an interview guest. So Pablo, welcome to the show. It's so exciting to have you here and even more exciting to know that you're actually inside the room where it happens in the halls of congress with today's show i think one of the things that we really want to talk about and i'm genuinely curious is what is going on these days in the halls of congress so i just want to clarify real quick that i'm actually in the room often i'm not in the room where it happens i'm often my, my I'm usually in the hall no 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 it's cool it's like the thing is like so i guess like the capital press pass that i have that i got two months ago it gives me pretty much all access to the capital complex you know what i mean but um not necessarily like sort of like in the room where it happens all the time. Now I can stand outside the room where it happens and wait for staffers to come out and get clues from different lawmakers and stuff like that who are talking to me. And it's just such a cool place and place to be. It's something that I always dreamt of. I always wanted to be one of these people that had access to those hallways, but it, you know, it took me like 13 years to actually get into the building. And now that we're in the building, Latino rebels is really crushing it. We're making a name for ourselves, not just as Latino rebels per se, but as Latinos in the building, because like there are some Latino reporters in the building and some really excellent ones in the building, no doubt. Um, but it's not necessarily the case that they're asking Latino questions every day. Now, what do I mean by Latino questions? Like last week we asked uh, the house, cause the house was in session for a couple of days last week. We asked the house about ice immigrations and customs enforcement. Now you and I as Latinos know that ICE is a big topic. These people come into our communities and make immigrants disappear. It's horrible what they do. It's horrible what they get away with. And what happened under the Trump administration was that this agency that Obama put on steroids was made into like the incredible Hulk, right? Of enforcement agencies. In the end, they weren't just in, uh, busting immigrant heads. They were used to, they were deployed in countries from coast to coast to put down Black Lives Matter. So it's an important thing in minority communities, it's an important thing in communities of color. No one, no one asks about ICE in, uh, in Congress until we got there last week. And we started asking about ICE in Congress. And the first person I asked about ICE in Congress was AOC, um, of course, because, you know, she has a position. She has a district that is, um, you know, over 50 percent Spanish speaking uh, as their first language. Uh, she has a district that has a lot of ICE activity in it. So does Ilhan Omar. So does Rashida Tlaib. I didn't get around to talking to Diana Presley up in Boston, but basically the squad comes from districts where ICE likes to go in and make immigrants disappear. So we asked them about them. We asked, what's the future of ICE? Is now that the agency has been scaled back from Trump to Biden, are, are this, is this agency going to be um, defunded? Because I mean, you know, if, if, all the, if all the enforcement and removal officers are working from home, why, why do we need them anymore? Well, I got, I, mean? a question like, on, I got a question on the ICE yeah. thing. So my question is, what do you think is going to happen with ICE and all, all its inner workings now that the Democrats are trying to pass some sort of immigration reform within that reconciliation bill that they're trying to pass, right? Is it going to – I mean, in my mind, I think that it – will it create problems in terms of how ICE works versus if the Democrats get together and make it happen where they can actually include that immigration reform within the reconciliation bill? I mean, those are two worlds that are about to collide, and they're not, you know, they're not right. of the same. No, they are two worlds that are about to collide, which is one of the reasons why it's so disappointing that we don't hear that much about it. I'm just one reporter. I can only report so much. But I will say this. No one knows, to answer your question, like what happens when, you know, a mass legalization program gets passed, if it gets passed, you know, uh, what happens to ICE? Like, what? why do we need ICE if the immigrants are suddenly legal? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So no one's really thinking about that um, at the time. But I will say this. It's incredibly disappointing to see some of these immigration groups negotiating against themselves in this deal. Yeah. Example, case in point, the Center for American Progress. Now, I, I don't know who or what they do. And on their immigration portfolio, this group is one of the worst because they brand themselves as a progressive organization, but they put out like staunch moderate policy positions when it comes to ice and then they go they go around in their hearty toddy ways like okay well i got a panel discussion this week so i don't really have time to talk about how i reached this number but the number they reached this week was six or they reached in july actually was uh, six million six million that's how many immigrants they wow. said were uh, were made to, that could be legalized and it's just like hold on a second what who told you that and where are you getting your numbers from and they wouldn't reply i asked them twice last week what where did you get this number of six million immigrants from and they were like yo we're not going to tell you because they pulled it out of their ass. They pulled it so out. It's of not even a real air. number. So it's like not it's even, not a, real even a real number because the thing is about who gets uh, who is qualified for a legalization program has nothing to do with what the Center for American Progress right, says. Right. It has to do with what the parliamentarian of the Senate says. And the parliamentarian is sort of like a yes, no. 
right? Like the parliamentarian of the Senate, in as much as it relates to budget reconciliation, is looking for some is looking for um, a revenue impact, a direct revenue impact on the budget, you know. Mm. And if the revenue impact exists, then the answer should be yes. Now, the re- the parliamentarian took a lot of heat earlier this year for nixing minimum wage that increase the minimum wage to $15, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that there's a lot of pressure on her at this point. Her name is Elizabeth McDonough. She's been the parliamentarian for a number of years. Her predecessor got fired by Trent Lott, as I recall, Mm. for refusing to include some provisions in a Republican-led budget reconciliation, I I think was the case anyway. Um, But either way, just so you know, and Bernie Sanders has said this again and again, the parliamentarian can be replaced. Like the parliamentarian can be replaced like any other staffer. So if she rules that immigrants are somehow not qualified for budget reconciliation, and this would be a continuance in a long line of excluding immigrants from relief, from any relief, from any economic relief, from any pandemic relief and so on, then yeah, I mean, she could definitely be replaced. And, you know, I don't know. I asked last week some sources within leadership, if within Democratic Party leadership in Congress, I asked, you know, well, do you have someone in mind to replace her if it does come to that? And everybody says the same thing. It's all it's like it's like they've talked about this because they all have the same answer. Their answer is always the same. Well, we hope it doesn't come to that. We but, hope it doesn't but, come to that. But if it know? does come to that, I mean, at the end of the day, when right. it comes to things like that, you, you know that if she does get replaced, the Republicans are literally going to just be chomping at the bit to just make that a partisan you know, conversation. And I'll, that's probably all we'll hear yeah. all over the news, right? Mainstream media. Well, I, see, I doubt that, honestly. As someone who came up in booking and mainstream news, whatever, you know, I don't think that anybody outside of the Capitol building could care less about the parliamentarian right. of the Senate. Give me a fucking right. break. The the uh, the the no, Afghanistan is on fire. New Orleans is underwater. Oh, no like, doubt. There's a million there's things COVID, to talk about. If the know, COVID is everywhere. Is, yeah, COVID is everywhere. I mean, no. children and their masks and all the rest are dominating the media coverage. No one's going to care. It's like, oh my god, the parliamentarian got you know, fired. Pablo, guys, we should really try no, and explain Pablo, the parliamentarian to Americans. No, yeah, I get, okay, I get, I get, I get that. You know what? Let me ask you this because I think I want to. You know, in these last three minutes that I want to spend with you, I want to ask you this. Now that you mentioned it, right now, parliamentarian aside, I mean, that's you're right. I mean, no one really cares sure. about that. But here's here's my question to you right now. In the last three minutes, if you can tell me, you mentioned, and it's accurate, we have a hurricane just wiping through Louisiana. We have COVID going out of control in Texas and in Florida. And we have what's going on in Afghanistan. And I know we got less than 24 hours before the end of that, you know, mission is supposed to be done. But I just read an article earlier this morning um, that, you know, apparently Biden, the Biden administration and 97 other allies have just negotiated with the Taliban to potentially be able to extend the mission a little bit to have more time to get more of those folks that want to leave and Americans that want to come back to the States. That being said, my question to you in the last three minutes is this. Yeah. With Congress on recess today, when they come back, what do you think, is I mean it's obvious that I, I view the Congress they can't really do three four five things at one time it seems like they can you know they can barely do one sometimes what do you think is going on when they come back and in the last three minutes tell me what do you think are going to be the major issues once Congress gets back in session right so the first issue is when do they come back now the House said that they're not going to be back until late September um, I don't think that that's going to be the case I think that this Afghanistan thing is bubbling up I think that the Louisiana the hurricane is going to bubble up I think that the House and the Senate will be recalled before they anticipated being called back now that said what will be on the docket when they get back there's a two track legislative agenda right now that looks at actually a three track legislative agenda right now that after the the voting uh, the, the HR4 voting John L. Lewis voting rights bill passed the House last week you got that that's going over to the Senate and you got infrastructure and budget reconciliation that's coming down to the house, right? So you have infrastructure bill, big bill, lots of spending, budget reconciliation, another massive bill, lots of spending and voting rights, which is really, really consequential if you're a Democrat, because if you're a Democrat, (laughs) you're toast without this voting rights bill. Republicans in state houses have decided to take it upon themselves to disenfranchise black people. Now they've been doing this forever. This is like part of the Republican playbook. They do not want black people to vote. So in state houses across the country, they've been passing all these draconian measures to create situations so that black people can't vote. But one thing that no one's really talking about, at least this week or right now, and I think I got to give a huge shout out to Olivia Beavers at Politico, is January 6th. Now, this is going to be a continued thing. Last week, there was a list of names of Trump inner circle people and including like Mark Meadows, chief of staff, Jim Jordan, some of these other people who they want their text messages. They want their like digital data from nine months back before January 6th, right? Like who was talking about this? Who was coordinating this? And anybody that was coordinating this is gonna be investigated really, really stringently by Benny Thompson, the chair of the Homeland Security Commission and the chair of the Special Select Commission on on January 6th. Um, 
they're going to be investigated and there are going to be additional hearings about that. Now, Olivia Beavers, back to what her reporting, right? Uh, she found uh, in Politico, it was in Playbook yesterday, um, that Jim Jordan actually had a second phone call with Donald Trump on January 6th. Now, he had admitted to having a phone call with him on January 6th, but now he's talking about a second phone call on January 6th that went that happened from the safe room. Now, that's, that's, that's juicy stuff, you know what I mean? Because anybody that was texting with the president while he was demanding that the Capitol be stormed and that these are good people and blah, blah, blah. That's bad. That's really bad. Now, there's a question, of course, of like how long the American political memory is going to be and if anybody actually cares about this anymore. But I know in the Capitol, especially amongst the press corps and the staffers, people are seriously traumatized by this. AOC, in particular, thought that she was not just going to be die, not just going to be killed, but that ho horrible things are going to happen to her before she got killed. She told this to uh, D uh, Dana Bash the other day. So props to Olivia on doing this like sort of recess week, recess weekend reporting and getting this scoop on Jim Jordan, because he is going to be called, you know, at some point to testify, I imagine. Pablo, man, I got to tell you, yeah. I got to tell you, Pablo, that right there, I, I didn't even think about the, I forgot about the January 6th uh, investigation. So now that you're in the halls of Congress, walking around there, doing your job, in which, by the way, everybody, viewers, if you haven't been reading Pablo's pieces, I mean, they're really well done. I mean, I'm not, granted, we're That's friends and, and, I, and, I, and I've known him a long time, but just the amount of uh, writing that he's been pushing out lately has been fantastic writing. He's got two great pieces that if you haven't read about two Latina chief of staffs that are in Congress, I mean, which is awesome. So if you want to kind of see how, you know, some of his writings, definitely check him out on Latina Rebels. Pablo, I guess before we leave, I want to say congratulations again. And now that you're there, I, I'd love to be able to do this more often because now I feel like I can talk to someone that's in there that's going to give it to us straight, that's not going to try to, you know, you know, push some sort of agenda or try to, you know, spin it, just give it to us straight and let our viewers kind of make a decision based on what you're hearing. I know you're developing great sources and um, I can't wait to read more of your pieces, but thank you so much for, you know, taking time this morning. And uh, I know we got no, so much more to do. No, of course. And thank you for having me. And thank you to the sources that are talking to me in Congress, especially the Latino sources nobody ever talked to before. That's really, to me, I think the real value in having me in there right now is that there's all these Latino perspectives. There's all these immigrant perspectives. There's all these people that people like, you know, that the, that the Congressional Reporting Corps and granted, the Congressional Reporting Corps is often very busy. They just aren't getting to. Yeah. Whereas I'm going right right into I'm trying to find them. So if you're a Latino, you're a Latina, you're Latin X, you're working in Congress, you're serving in Congress. Hit me up. I'd love to talk to you. Well, with that said, and I'm going to take a little little spin from Pablo's days, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs>